Welcome back to The Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we are going to continue looking at the GEC Marconi mystery. In the years 1987 to 1988, a further spate of deaths prompted more people to consider if any of them could be connected. If you haven't already listened to the first episode, go back now and listen so that it all makes sense. This episode does contain some descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. During the years 1982 to 1986, a number of deaths of men who worked in some capacity for the defence industry began to cause some suspicion. The defence industry is very large and contains many companies and contractors that in some way have connections with government contracts and new technology. The fact that these men were involved in these industries may not have been seen as suspicious, as of course the industry is so big that many people are involved in it. During the years 1987 to 1988, however, the number of odd and bizarre deaths and occurrences appeared to increase and the situation became much more noticeable. In January 1987, it was reported that Richard Pugh had been found dead in his flat. Richard was a computer expert who it is reported had recently left a job which involved digital networks and other technological work associated with the defence industry. One report stated that Richard may have been a consultant for the MOD, the Ministry of Defence. The circumstances in which Richard was found in his flat were somewhat unusual. It is reported that Richard was discovered with a large rope wrapped completely around his body, a plastic bag over his head and his feet bound together. In this case, the coroner ruled that Richard's death was caused by an accident, due to sexual misadventure. It was believed that Richard may have been involved in a sexual experiment that unfortunately went wrong. It was of course difficult to establish this. However, the idea that Richard was able to do all of these things to himself was not easy to believe for everyone. The odd circumstances, like in other cases that we have covered, could not be completely explained. However, the official ruling of an accident was listed. It was only a few days later that another odd and tragic death occurred. On January the 12th, 1987, Dr John Britton was at home and was getting ready to go to work. He had returned from a trip to the US not long before, and since his return he had come down with some sort of illness that meant that he had taken some time off work. John worked at RAD, which stands for Royal Armament Research and Development Establishment. They were involved with military simulation and war game projects. John Britton also had been employed at the Royal College of Military Science at Shrivenham, the same place where Lieutenant Anthony Godley had disappeared from previously. As John had been suffering with a sore throat, he hadn't been in work on his normal schedule. He had decided to go back to work on January the 12th, despite still not feeling a lot better. It was reported that Dr John Britton had left the house and gone around to the garage to the car. Around an hour later, John Britton was discovered slumped over the steering wheel, and tragically, he was dead. It was initially unclear what might have happened, as it was believed that John had left as normal for work. It was later established that John had been the victim of carbon monoxide poisoning, due to the car being left running. It appeared that Dr Britton had got into the car and succumbed to the fumes. The question of whether this would have happened to a very knowledgeable scientist began to be asked. Why had this happened, and most importantly, how? The book Open Verdict by Tony Collins states that John had not attempted to open the car door and had not tried to open the garage door, which suggests that perhaps John had not had the intention of leaving for work. The coroner ruled John's death as accidental. It was ruled that there did not appear to be any indication that he might have wanted to take his own life. The ruling of an accident, however, seemed odd to some, due to the fact that John was a renowned scientist, and would have surely known what would have happened if he had left the engine running. The official ruling, however, was that it was a tragic accident, 
and this is how the case has been left since 1987. The month after Dr John Britton's death, another death occurred which appeared to have some similarities. David Skeels worked as an engineer for the Marconi Company, and in February 1987 he was discovered dead inside his car. A hosepipe had been connected to his exhaust, and it was ruled that he had died from carbon monoxide poisoning. David's death was ruled with an open verdict, meaning that the coroner could not decide exactly what had happened in this situation. Again, David's death is included in the list due to the fact that he worked for Marconi. In the same month as David Skeel's death, 46-year-old Victor Moore was working as a design engineer with Marconi Space and Defence Systems. It is believed that he had been working on a project in Portsmouth which involved infrared satellites. Shortly after finishing work on this project, Victor was found dead from a drug overdose. There is not much information included about this death, however the book Open Verdict discusses the fact that he had been suffering noticeable strains at work, and this could have been a factor in his death. One report about his death implies that there was an MI5 investigation However, no report or information was ever published. The official ruling into the death was suicide. Unfortunately, this would not be the last death connected to these industries that was reported in February 1987. Another death that happened that month was the death of Peter People. Peter worked at the Royal Military College of Science and had worked there for 25 years in 1987. He worked in the metallurgy department at the college, which meant he studied the behaviour of metallic elements and the compounds that they are made up of. By all accounts, he enjoyed his job and was doing well in his field. On Saturday the 21st of February, Peter and his wife had been at a dinner party and the pair had then drove home to Shrivenham. It is reported that Peter heard an odd knocking sound underneath the car, which bothered him, so when they returned home he wanted to check what it might have been. His wife went to bed, and it was only in the morning that she realised that he was not with her. She went to look for him, and noticed that the garage door was closed, but she could hear the running of the car engine. Upon entering the garage, she made an awful discovery. Peter was lay underneath the car, aligned with the exhaust pipe, with the engine running. Unfortunately, he was dead. The circumstances, similar to the other cases we have looked at, were certainly odd. Both the police and the coroner in this case were also suspicious of what could have happened. Both accident and suicide were looked into to try and explain the situation. The book Open Verdict explains that both were quickly ruled out by police, as they did not believe that suicide would have been carried out this way. And when tested, it was impossible that Peter could have accidentally fallen underneath the car, as it was a relatively small garage and did not leave much space. This appeared to only leave murder as a motive. Open Verdict discusses that if the car had been running all night, there would have been black deposits on the wall of the garage, and there were none. So if it hadn't happened when Peter got home, what would have led him to go back inside the garage? Carbon monoxide poisoning was listed as the cause of death. However, the coroner was unable to figure out exactly what happened. Therefore, an open verdict was ruled in his case. There are some parallels that can perhaps be drawn between the death of Peter People and that of Dr John Britton. The most clear parallels were that Peter and John both had worked, or currently worked, at the Royal College of Military Science, and both had been killed by carbon monoxide poisoning in their own garages. Both men had also reportedly taken a trip to the US not long before their deaths. Of course, this could have all been a coincidence, and the rulings were different. John's being ruled a suicide and Peter's as an open verdict. The similarities caused some to wonder if there was a connection of sorts. A month after Peter People's death, 
the death of another man caught the attention of the public due to the odd circumstances in which his death occurred. On March 30th, 1987, David Sands was driving on his way to work. It is known that he made a sudden U-turn on a dual carriageway and began travelling in the opposite direction. He then crashed at high speed into a disused Little Chef restaurant. The police were at the scene of the terrible incident immediately. It was evident from tracking the car across the road that David had not attempted to veer away from the restaurant at any point. There were no skid marks or attempts to stop what he was doing. There were some very odd features to this incident. David had in fact been wearing his seatbelt and had not taken it off during the incident. It was also discovered that he had two five-gallon cans of petrol in his boots, which had made the incident that much more dangerous. The car had in fact been engulfed in flames on impact and had destroyed an awful lot of evidence. David worked for eSAMS, which was a sister company to Marconi. eSAMS was a computer consultancy and electronics company. They were also closely related to the Star Wars project. The Star Wars project was a name made up for the Strategic Defence Initiative, which was a missile defence system that was being worked on for the United States against nuclear weapons. It was a bold and ambitious project set out from 1983 by Ronald Reagan and involved many scientists and specialists around the world. David was a senior scientist working in Camberley in Surrey for ESAMS and had been on his way to work that morning as usual. The inquest into David's death appeared to reveal that there seemed to be no connection with either foul play or suicide. It was revealed that two days before he died, David had gone missing for around six hours. His wife rang the police, clearly worried about where her husband may have gone. It was believed that he reappeared that night and said that he had been driving around and thinking. This suggested that perhaps David had been preoccupied by something and that something may have been on his mind that caused him to need some time to himself. The inquest ruled that it could not be determined what had happened to David and so like many of the other cases, an open verdict was ruled. Eleven days after David Sands' death, another man would be involved in a tragic incident. Stuart Gooding was a postgraduate student at the Royal College of Military Science. While he was abroad in Cyprus, he was involved in a collision with a lorry while he was driving. It is believed that he drove on the wrong side of the road and headed towards an oncoming lorry. It was determined at the inquest into Stuart's death that this was an accident and that there was nothing that could have been done to prevent it. The driver of the oncoming lorry was unhurt in the incident. There was not a lot of information provided about what exactly Stuart did at the Royal College of Military Science and the fact that this is where he worked caused concern due to the fact that other men that had died had worked there. This was also another death that seemed to be caused by a road accident and this is another similarity in many of these cases. Around a week after Stuart Gooding's death, two deaths happened in the UK on the same day. On April 17th, 1987, George Kuntis was found in his upturned car in the River Mersey in Liverpool. It was believed that he had died as a result of drowning from being trapped in the car. George was included in this list due to his role as a systems analyst at Bristol Polytechnic University. It is unknown why George was in Liverpool, as there had not been a lot of information published about his death. It is known that his death was ruled as being caused by misadventure. It is reported that some of George's family did not believe this could be true and wanted it to be investigated further. That same day, another death occurred, but this one was slightly unusual 
as this is the only death of a woman that is often connected to this list of cases. The death of Sharni Warren has some very unusual features that caused some alarm. The 17th of April was the start of the Easter weekend and was a holiday in the UK. The next day on Saturday the 18th, a woman who was walking her dog noticed the body of a woman floating in Taplow Lake in Buckinghamshire. When the body was taken out of the lake, it was discovered that she had a noose around her neck and had been gagged. Her ankles were tied with tow rope and wrists were tied around her back. The body was identified as 26-year-old Sharni Warren. Her car was found in a lay-by near the lake in somewhat of a disarray. It is often reported that it looked like it had been searched through. The car could not be driven away in first or second gear and there was no handbag or keys found at the scene. The lake was dragged by frogmen to try and find any other items that may have found their way to the bottom of the lake. On conversation with family, it appeared that Sharni had been having a very normal Friday. She had been to her parents' house and had mown her lawn at her home. She had then planned to take the cuttings to her parents' home to put on the compost heap. She unfortunately did not make it there. What had made her travel to the lake, however, which was around seven miles from their home, is unknown. It did not appear that Sharni had made any prior plans, or had intended to be going to that area before that day. So what really happened? After her death it was implied by police that perhaps suicide could have been what had happened, citing that sometimes in these situations the scene appears unusual, and that the fact that Sharni had tied up feet and wrists did not necessarily point to foul play. This narrative, however, changed later on in the investigation when the case was featured on an episode of Crime Watch. The book Open Verdict discusses that featuring Sharni's case on the show led to some leads coming in about it. The police, however, continued to be elusive about whether Sharni's death was being treated as a suicide or a murder. The inquest into the death discussed all lines of inquiry from the fact that there were no signs of a struggle, such as an abundance of bruises or cuts on Sharni's body, to suggest foul play, to the fact that a well-dressed man was seen close to the scene during the time that Sharni could have been at the lake. The coroner listened to all the evidence provided and returned a very frustrating verdict that was seen in many other cases. An open verdict was decided upon. Sharni's death is often included in the list of suspicious deaths, due to the fact that she worked for a company called Microscope. Microscope made intelligent electronic systems, however at the time of Sharni's death they denied that they had anything to do with defence projects or industries. However, about a month later, GEC made the announcement that they were making one of its first acquisitions in years. They bought the microscope company for £16 million. This meant that like the other cases, Sharni had become connected with the defence industry. Unlike the other cases, Sharni had not been a programmer or a scientist. She had been a secretary to a manager at the microscope company. So the idea that she had some knowledge about the industry may not necessarily stack up. The handling of Sharni's case, however, was not appreciated by many people around her. Her case has often been connected with the other cases due to the fact that she worked for a company that was later involved with GEC, and her death occurred at the same time as many other deaths involved. The question is, what really happened? In many of these cases, a ruling of an open verdict causes a lot more questions than answers. This means that nothing concrete can be determined about cases and so they continue to cause the public to wonder about what really happened. It is also very sad that these cases have not been officially solved and there is no obvious answer for their families. There were, unfortunately, more deaths that occurred into 1988 
and next episode we will look into the last cases that are connected to the GEC Marconi mystery and look into theories and information that has come out since. The book Open Verdict by Tony Collins has again been such a help in this case. His amazing research has been pivotal in being able to write these episodes. If you are interested, the information is in the show notes. Thank you for listening to today's episode. We are fast approaching the one year anniversary of the podcast and I am amazed every day that we have listeners. So thank you so much for being part of our podcast journey. If you want to share us with anyone you think might enjoy it, please do. If you want to support us further, you can leave us a review on iTunes or you can follow us on social media at The Unseen Podcast on Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. If you have any cases you want to suggest, please let us know on there or at our email address at theunseenpod at gmail.com. I will always reply and read everything you send me. Lastly, please stay tuned for a promo from the Of Myth and Mercy podcast, which I am sure you will enjoy. Thanks for listening, and as always, I'm Caprice, and this has been Unseen. Obscure cases, lesser known crimes, horrific incidents hardly if ever covered before. Uncovering and exposing all of these is the modus operandi of what every of Myth and Mercy podcast episode aims to do. My name is Cassandra and I invite you to check us out on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms. Check out our website at ofmythandmercy.com. Listen in and remember the question that Charles Bukowski asked. Mercy, I ask? Mercy? What does the human race know about mercy? Mercy.